So if you're not teaching Sunday school, you're not an Awana, you're in trouble. <laughs> or you could come and stand up here next Sunday. Uh, but uh, I really appreciate the very many people who are involved in serving here at uh, Grace Church. And um, I'm honored to be the pastor of a church where people are willing to uh, jump right in and get involved. I'm thankful to you for all, thankful to all of you for that. <clears throat> Let me welcome you once again. <clears throat> Excuse me, just a minute. And so I drifted, I floated. I just came in late because I wanted to see what it was like to come in late. (laughs) (laughs) And I, as I was coming uh, in upstairs, down the stairs, I noticed there was a whole lot of bicycles up there. Ah, God bless you folks who ride your bicycles to church. I just apologize, we don't have a single place for you to park your car, but at least you can park your bicycle. And um, I also, I had the opportunity to just see what the thing, how it was out there, and I think that the, there's a need for us to improve um, what goes on outside. Uh, those folks who sit back there right outside the sound room and right back here, you, you sit on these benches with no, no backs on them, and uh, if the preacher goes long, your back gets sore. I feel sorry for you. I'm sorry. I'm gonna, we're going to get some chairs with backs on them to make them a little bit more comfortable for you. And then out in the uh, fellowship hall... That thing is a cavern. It just, it, uh, there's sounds everywhere and echoes. And, and so uh, we're going to uh, we're gonna work to improve the sound, improve the environment out there too. Uh, the reason is <clears throat> there's some people who are out there right now. Uh, and I appreciate those who, who are, are there and do want to, uh, I wish everybody could fit in here. There's still about 10, 15 seats in here if some of you out there want to come in, but you have to sit on the front row, so <laughs> you can weigh whether or not you want to come in or not. <clears throat> but um, uh, anyway, it was, it was good for me. I never get to go out there. I never get to see what's happening. I got to check the Sunday school rooms, and it was just good to check it out. Uh, in some other news, very important news, last Sunday, as a matter of fact, about uh, this time, my youngest daughter, Bridget, was giving birth to their very first child. Yes. Um, 2.8 kilograms, about 21 inches, and uh, her name is Callie Jane. I have no idea where that name came from, but it's kind of cool. They live in California, so. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, she's number 11. Uh, four granddaughters and a boatload of grand boys, grandsons, and so um, I am grateful to um, grateful for God's blessing. It was a bit of, um, well, Grandma Candy wasn't there, which I know she would have been if she could have been. So. But nonetheless, it was, it was a great, um, great experience. <clears throat> I mean, it's great for me because I just heard on the telephone. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, two years ago, about this time, we opened up the hub. And um, what it, it's been, um, it's been a great experience. How many of you have never, never been in the hub? One. <laughs> you, you get a free cup of coffee. Just tell them Pastor Homer said so. <laughs> yes, free cup of coffee. And uh, I want to encourage you to, to hang out there. It's, it's just a, a nice place. It was a dream and a, a, a vision I wanted to develop, and we're still in the process of doing so. And uh, if you have ideas and ways to make the hub more useful during the week by using meeting rooms and, and uh, even the playroom for birthdays and so forth, we would really appreciate it. But it's a cool place to hang out. The only thing is, it didn't come free. Nothing's free. If people say, well, my salvation's free. No, Jesus paid for you. That's what makes it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and... Um, uh, the thing is, it just takes uh, some, it takes cold, hard cash to get some things done. 
Now, I joke, you know, about how the air conditioner is not paid by faith and so forth, and it's true, but it's, um, in a sense, it's, uh, we do need faith to, to see these things come to pass. Financially, at Grace Church, we're completely reliant on the gifts and the giving of God's people. And so, in your bulletin, we also give a, a report there of what kind of, uh, uh, of uh, income is coming in. We, Grace Church, are paying for the construction and paying for the hub. It cost about 12 million NT, and it was a good price for the quality. It's a nice place. I mean, those are real bricks on the wall there, by the way. The suggestion, instead of putting bricks up, was to put up brick, wall, brick wallpaper. And my wife would have nothing of it. She says, if it's going to look like brick, it's going to be brick. So, it is. And it's, um, <clears throat> for, for what we have, we're really grateful for it. We set a goal of paying this off. We paid off $2 million already. We owe $10 million. We made an agreement with the Evangelized China Fellowship that we would pay them $1 million a year for the next 10 years, which is a, it's also a good thing too. But um, uh, here's, here's the deal, and I, I'm just going to be pretty, pretty straight about this thing. I don't plan on being here in ten, for 10 years. In 10 years, I'll be 76. That's just too old to be a pastor. So um, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I think pastoring is for young men, just like I think having families is for young, family, young men too. So um, I, I have a goal, and, and, and the leaders have agreed, and our financial director has agreed that uh, we would double up and pay $2 million a year for the next five years and get it paid because that way it just frees us up. We don't have that debt hanging over us, and we can be done. So this year is going to be our first year to pay $2 million. <clears throat> at our financial, our, our, at our um, leaders meeting two weeks ago from today, we were given a financial report, and uh, Bun, who is our financial director, said, not going to happen, guys. Uh, we'll be lucky this year if we're able to come up with $1 million. Well, <clears throat> um, I was a bit discouraged. But I realized that when we made a decision and, and, and an effort to do so, God, God knew what we were saying and so forth. And, and uh, at that very moment that we're having this discussion, there was a donor in our church who wanted to give a million dollars to Grace Church. I, I say that to say this. This is just an example <clears throat> of the sufficient grace of God. At a time when you think, we just can't make it, we just can't go, God's got something else going on that you don't even know about. This has been my life story as to how God has supplied at times when I just didn't think it was possible to be done. The donors didn't know, they had no idea the pressure we were under, and, at the, at the, and while the time when they're preparing this gift to give, we're sweating it out in the meeting as to how we're going to, to get this thing done. So I just want to say I am very grateful and very thankful to them for their very timely gift. And I say timely because it's only because they responded to what God was laying on their heart to do. And I don't talk much about giving and offering and so forth. I don't want to feel like I'm trying to wring it out of your pockets, you know, and uh, a dime at a time and that kind of thing. I just... I just know that God is at work and God continues to do his work and I'm grateful to you, to all of us who are willing to step up when the time comes and just to do what we can. So uh, we have ways in which you can participate. We have what we call as a cornerstone and if you, uh, if you, are, if you give 100000 a year, um, it would, you would be a, a cornerstone donor. If you want to give a million dollars a year, you would be a mega cornerstone. <laughs> <clears throat> but um, I, I, I say that because uh, I'm going to be speaking today about um, gracious generosity. Not because I'm going to speak about giving. I'm not going to be speaking about giving. I'm preaching today about sufficient grace. God's grace is sufficient. It's adequate. It's enough. It always is. The verse that... Uh, we'll be looking at today mainly is, is um, from a passage of scripture that preachers love to preach on. It's a passage of scripture that over and over and over again, pastors and preachers will go to this because it, it's, it's about giving. 
It's about giving generously. And many times, uh, people may be put off about pastors always talking about money, always talking about money. So <clears throat> I try not to. I just figure God can, God can do the talking much better than I can. So if God's talking, you just need to be listening, that's all. <laughs> If we're to know anything about God, there's this one thing that we can be sure of, that he is a very gracious, giving God. How do we know that? He gave himself. He offered himself as a sacrifice, the Lamb of God, to take away the sin of the world. And Paul said about the church in Philippi, he said about this church, in, in, when he was talking about them in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he says they gave themselves first. They gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. And this is my prayer for Grace Church. My prayer for Grace Church is that we would first give ourselves to the Lord. If we'll first give ourselves to the Lord, then by his will, his work will be done. Now, <clears throat> I don't in intend to speak about giving today. Uh, I tend to speak from a passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians, and we'll be looking in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. So if you'll turn to 2 Corinthians 9. And you don't even have to turn there. We, we put it up there right so you can... You don't even have to bring your Bible. Right? We do it all for you. We just map it everything out for you. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And I want to begin reading from verse 6. The subtitle uh, on this particular passage is having to do with the cheerful, cheerful giver. Again, I, I'm going to remind you, pastors preach on this all the time, okay? And you'll see why in just a minute. <clears throat> the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of his service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God. Because of your submission, flowing from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you in prayer and for you because of this surpassing grace of God, upon you. And he says, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. That inexpressible gift that he's talking there is not about the offering that was given by the Corinthians to uh, the Philippians and not about the offering that was given by them then to the church that was in Jerusalem uh, suffering at a very difficult time. I want you to notice something about um, <clears throat> that verse we read that uh, God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Here's the thing. Notice in that verse that it's not our ability that God is talking about. It's not about our ability to give. Some have a great ability, some don't have. That's not the issue here. The issue is our availability. Our availability. Are we available to God to be used by Him? That availability is through God and through His grace. Also, when we look at those verses 10 through 12, 
Notice that it, it's, it's God who get, does the enriching. Too often, we're working so hard to be the good Christian, to do the righteous things. But it is God who gives us the generosity. It's God through his grace that makes us generous and through that produces thanksgiving to God. God loves thanksgiving. God loves when we, when we thank him. He loves it when others then say thank you for being used by God to do the work here. And again, I want to say thank you for what you do in Grace Church, not only in the offering, but in the, in the time that you put in. And for those who are teaching in the Sunday school, those who are helping in the, in the Iwana, those who are giving so we can uh, help and, uh, get wells and we can help people in, in Nepal. It's, it's God who enriches us and allows us to be generous in every way to produce this overflowing in thanksgiving. And then in verse 13, I want us to notice this. <clears throat> Notice that the praise is offered not for the gift itself. Praise is not offered for the gift itself, but for the spiritual virtues of the donors expressed in the gift. I think that's so great. We get caught up so much in, in, the, in the money, in the amounts. And I, I, when I say that, I look at myself most of all because I look and see, I mean... And, and I need to know how we're doing here. But it's interesting that this verse doesn't emphasize the gift. It emphasizes much more so the spiritual virtues of the donors that were expressed in the giving. And that's what we need to look at. Because he says it's by your obedience. It's by your submission. Why? I'm simply being obedient to my confession that I believe Jesus is God. And what does that mean when we say Jesus is God? Hebrews 10.23 tells us, hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering because he who promised is faithful. You see that? We look to ourselves to being able to do this thing. We look to ourselves to being able to accomplish things for God. Man, I want to do great things for God. It's not about us doing it. It's about the grace of God who works through us, gives us the gifting to do his work. Generosity is a testimony, it's a witness to the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I spent 15 years in Hong Kong as a church planter. Uh, I went there, I didn't know a single person. On, well, I, I knew one person, he's the one who got me into the country. Um, that one person who got me into the country was a doctor, a British doctor who spent years in Taiwan. That British doctor was the one who delivered me at the Mackay Hospital there when I was born in Taiwan here. And he prayed over me. He prayed over me and said, God, please use this young man to bring the good news to this world. And he was the one, Dr. Donald Dale, was the one who met me at the airport. He was my guarantor to get me a visa into Hong Kong. And... Uh, we didn't, the first Sunday night, I didn't, the first Sunday morning didn't go anywhere, but first Sunday night we went to a Baptist church in town because I, it, was in, it was English, so that's why we went. And um, met the pastor who took us out to a little town called Yenlang, Yunlong, Hong uh, Kong Yunlong, and, and uh, showed us a small little group of Nepalis who were meeting there. Gurkha soldiers they were with the British regiment. And <clears throat> it was in English, but just a small little group. We met in a room that 20 was overflowing. When we got 20 people in there, it was just packed to the gills. And, and God just, how do I say? Did he speak to me or write it on the heavens? No, he just said, this is where I want you to be. And in seven years, seven years later, we bought a property next door for that little church, um, Lighthouse Baptist Church. It was, that property was one million U.S. dollars. Yeah, I just looked at it, I said, my soul. I'll never forget, I'll never forget, one Sunday after church, I took this little group of believers, there was 10 of us. We stood in that 4,000 square foot floor uh, of the 
of that building there, and we held hands, and I prayed, and I said, God, we're claiming this for you. This is where Lighthouse Baptist Church is going to be. Well, it wasn't until several years later that one of the guys who was in that, he said, Pastor, I thought you were crazy. <laughs> in my mind, he was telling me, in my mind, there's no way. Well, <laughs> in my mind, I thought the same thing. <clears throat> How are, we, how are we going to do it? We had, a, we had a seven-year mortgage. That was all they did. They didn't do 30-year mortgages on a million dollars. Um, I, I just say this. People ask me all the time, how do you do it, Dave? You should write a book. I couldn't begin to. I have no idea how this happens. I have no idea. And, and, and here I am uh, in the ministry over 30 years. The church has been, over, has been celebrated its 30th anniversary there in Hong Kong. They're doing fine. I find myself in, the, in a, in a in, um, and that was a Cantonese-speaking church over there, so I'm very relieved to be in an English-speaking church. And uh, I, I look at what God is doing here, and I'm amazed. I'm just, I'm just uh, dumbfounded. And people say, well, Dave, how do you, I mean, I say my, uh, people say my, my uh, uh, peers say, wow, Dave, how do you do that? I really don't know. I'm almost ashamed to say so. It's not like I had a master plan. It's just that God is able and his grace is sufficient. And that's all I know. And that verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, is my life verse. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always, well, that's the King James Version, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you so that having all sufficiency in all things, at all times, you may abound to every good work. Four times he uses the word all. What does that include? All. And then he says the purpose is that you may abound in every good work. What we need to decide and what we need to know from God is, is this a good work to be done? Is this a good work? Because here's the promise of God. God says he's able to make all grace abound so that having all sufficiency, what does that mean, all sufficiency? It means everything that you need in all things, at all times, may abound in every good work. I can tell you time and time again, I've gone back to this verse and said, God, I don't know how you're going to work this thing out, but you said that, not me. <laughs> and just simply let him do his work. So I, I wanted to look this morning at um, three aspects of God's grace, his all-sufficient grace. And uh, I can promise you, that it's highly unlikely that we're going to get through it all today. So when it comes time, I'm just going to cut it off, all right? Okay. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like us to look at the attributes of God's grace. What are the attributes of God's grace? This is um, an amazing thing. I, I, I've reflected on this all week long. In other words, what qualities, what qualities or features are characteristic or inherent in God's grace? One of those qualities or features is that it, it is a gift. It is a gift. Now think of that for a moment. Because in religion, it's not uncommon for people to believe that they need to work for God's favor. Ask around for those who, who and I... And you can even ask other Christians because there's other Christians who are caught up in the, in the whole religion thing. They're, they're caught up with trying to do the good thing to, make, to, to be a good Christian. When God's grace is a gift, God's grace is, is, is this gift is, he says, I'm going to give you myself. <laughs> God comes to us. And he says, I'm going to give, give me to you. Why? Because I'm a sinner. i got a sin problem. I can't take care of the sin problem. And God, through Jesus Christ, comes and says, Dave, you can't take care of the sin problem. 
but let me do it for you. And he was nailed to a cross, died a cruel death as a painful punishment that I should have. That's the gift. And what does he charge me for it? Listen carefully. What does he charge me for that gift? Well, if he charges me, it's not a gift, right? This is a good thing to remember. Because some, some people might say, well, if you give me a gift, then I'll do this for you. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's not a gift. That's called bribe. Gift is free. And by the way, parents, it's, you can't tell your kids you're going to give them a gift if they do the homework. That's not a gift. A gift is free. A gift is given. God's grace comes to us as a gift. It cannot be bought. It cannot be earned. It's simply the merciful kindness by which God exerts his holy influence to draw us, to lead us to Jesus. And only Jesus can be that perfect sacrifice. He's the only one who has endured the holy, righteous wrath of God against sin, and he took it all upon him, and he paid the price. And through this gift, Jesus graciously strengthens us, increases our faith, it's his gift of grace. It's, it's this grace that, that, that kindles this fire within us, this desire to live as Christ-like because he says, I'll live in you. I'll live through you. What an amazing gift that is. God's not saying, I want you to do something that I know you can't do because you know you can't do it. God says, I want you to live a, a perfect, God-honoring, Christ-like life. And guess what? Let me live it through you. Let me live it through you. It's my gift to you. It's my grace. The other thing that really strikes me about God's gift is this. It's infinite. Now, <clears throat> when I say that it's infinite, it's describing how vast and how wide and how broad the grace of God is. But I don't know about you. I, 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 live in, I live in a finite world. I remind myself of this all the time. I live in a finite world. What that means is simply, I'm right here right now. Okay? And you are too. So I'm quite limited to where I am. Now, I may be able to go somewhere else and see something else, but I'm very limited. And when I, when I start feeling pretty big, when I start feeling, oh, wow, Dave, you've, you've got this, man. You're doing all right. Then it, it's very good to pause. And, and God graciously <laughs> paused me this week to reflect on the fact that <clears throat> I am one of about, what, 26 million living on this island here? 26 million. It's quite a few people. You might think six million is a lot of people. That's about how many in Metro Taipei. And here I am, one person. But this little tiny island, what is this? I mean, there are cities in China, cities in China that have more population than this entire island. And not just China, but other cities around the world. And <clears throat> not only that, I'm, uh, I'm on a planet that is circling a sun that is one of... How many solar systems? I don't know how many solar systems in this, in this universe. But this universe is incredibly vast. And not only that, the universe is expanding. It's expanding. It's growing. They say at about 67 kilometers a second. You, they're pretty uh, involved scientists. I, I, I'll tell you what I learned this week. Um, I, I don't have any problem with science. I just happen to know that science has a lot of guesses to it, too. <laughs> they say a lot of things that they really think that this is the best answer for us. So people who say that silent, silent, science, silent, science should be silent. <laughs> science has all the facts and they've got it. 
it's it they they have a lot of they have a lot of things that they think are probably true and might be true, but they can't be verify can't verify it. But here's the thing. Um, science is a lousy god. It's science is just a lousy god. And when I stop to think about where I am in all of this, I'm very grateful for very intelligent people who have studied and found out what's going on and talked about how the earth is, uh, the, the, the universe is expanding. Well, my question is this. I had a good uh, friend named Mark Willman. His parents were missionaries here in Taiwan, best friends growing up. And um, uh, he, he went into science and physics, and, and he had that kind of brain to do that. But he also drifted away from God and had no use for God and, and so forth. And so we were having this conversation, and I said, well, uh, how, how, do you, how do you scientists deal with this concept of infinity? Because it is a concept. I mean, it's, it, it's just an idea. We finite, listen, we finite people are not able to get our minds around the infinite. We just can't. That's why I'm glad that God became Jesus and came here to show us. But the thing is, <clears throat> he told me that, and this was a long time ago now, he said that there, the scientists are starting to believe that there's a... Um, there's a border to space. In other words, it's confined. In other words, you could go to the edge of space. Well, there, in a sense, that's true because uh, the universe is expanding. It's expanding at an enormous rate. And what is it expanding into? It's expanding into a vacuum. All right. So it's expanding into nothingness. Now, you, you have to understand something. A scientist, very learned men say that, that the universe is expanding into the vacuum. Okay. Can we agree with that? So where did the Big Bang come from then? It had to have started in a vacuum. Do you know what a vacuum is? So to me, to me, if you if you go too far with this thing, you get backed into a corner. Like, you know, it's it. Uh, and and again, I uh, some people believe, and I would be one of those. The Bible account of the the seven day creation, but I al- I also think about this. There's no problem for God to create using a Big Bang, if that's what He chose to do. Why? Because he would be the one who would put the things together to cause the initial explosion, which was going to expand. I mean, God can do that. However, here's the thing, too. Another reason why I don't have a too big a problem with that is because uh, I have six children. I know where they came from. All right? And if you look at the science behind that, when the egg and the sperm t- come together, their entire DNA is within that. Their entire DNA is within that and, and what's going to shape them. Isn't it possible that the entire DNA of the universe could have been in that initial explosion that took place back then? I'm just speculating. My point in saying any and all of this is simply to get you to understand. When we talk about infinite, we really don't understand. It's beyond our comprehension. And the fact is, God's grace is infinite. How does that work for us then today? God being infinite, here are some synonyms for infinite, all right? Absolute. This is part of those 61 pages, so here we go. (laughs) All-embracing, bottomless, boundless, enduring, Enormous, eternal, everlasting, illimitable, immeasurable, immense, incalculable, incessant, never stopping, inestimable, inexhaustible, interminable, measureless, never ending, numberless, perpetual, stupendous, supreme, total, unbounded, Uncounted, unending, untold, vast, wide, without end, without limit, without number. 
Whoa. That is a very brief description of the gift that God offers to you and I. Are you kidding me? I, and, and the reason I say it is this. We have, we have barely begun to dip our finger into the vastness of the grace of God. And we walk around like poor old Christians. God have mercy. And it's like, really, do you know the gift that's been given to us? When we say God is able, what are we talking about? We're talking about the infinite greatness of God and his grace, grace that he's given to us. So if God's grace is sufficient, what does that mean? Well, let's expand on it. Like expanding space. We're going to go 67 kilometers a second. <clears throat> if God's grace is sufficient, it means there's no boundary beyond which one is out of reach of God. <laughs> yeah. No limit beyond which his grace can't go. No end where his grace is depleted and gone. No quitting where his grace has given up. No stopping, for there is nothing that can say to God's grace, stop, no more, no further. No depth too deep, whether of sin or discouragement or depression, that cannot be plumbed by God's infinite grace. There's no darkness in which his gracious light cannot penetrate. There's no frustrated, chaotic soul to which his grace cannot bring peace. No bitterness which his grace cannot sweeten. No anger which cannot be assuaged by his infinite grace. No evil which cannot be overcome. No loneliness which his grace cannot befriend. And no emptiness which his gracious presence cannot fill. There's no hurting heart which his gracious touch cannot renew and restore. There's no discord which his grace cannot harmonize. No broken relationship which he cannot restore. No barriers or mountains or obstacles which grace cannot overcome. There's no valley so deep or so cold or so painful or so dark and so depressing that he will not be there. There's no weight or burden so crushing which he cannot bear. No season nor time which his grace is not available at. No day nor week nor month nor year nor age nor millennial where his grace cannot work. There's no sinful soul which cannot be delivered and transformed by his infinite grace. No divide which his grace cannot cross and no division which his grace cannot unite and make as one. And why wouldn't you want the gift of God's grace? Honestly. Why wouldn't we just fall down on our face and say, God, have mercy on me. Be gracious to me. God, save me. It's a gift of infinite value. It has to be of infinite value because it's the only, it's, it's, it's a gift that only God can give. The infinitely precious Son of God was given to purchase this gift for us. There is no one, no, no thing, not, nothing whatsoever more precious than the Son of God, and He is the one who bought this gift to give to us. The infinitely pure Son of God, without sin, without blemish, without any spot or wrinkle, He became sin. He didn't just take sin on Him. He became my sin in order to deliver this gift of grace to us. The sinless one. Again, uh, beyond my comprehension, how one 
so pure, so holy, so righteous, could take on sin. The infinitely priceless Son of God gave his life to redeem us, to buy us back. He's the only one who could pay the price. He came to redeem his fallen and rebellious creation. You know something? Jesus went all in. All in. And you know, when he says the same thing to us, I want you to be all in. He can say that. Because he did exactly the same for us. God's infinite and amazing grace. That's the attribute that we can see. But look, let's look at his attitude, the attitude of God's grace. What is it like? What, how, is, how is God, he, is he stingy? Is he holding it back and say, hey, mine, not yours? Or is he one who's saying, I give it to you? The thing is, in the scripture that we read, and God is able to make all grace, what? Abound. Abound toward you. He's not, he's not up there saying, okay, I'm going to divvy this thing out here. All right, Dave, you already had $2 yesterday. What are you going to get today? No, 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 man. It's, it's all there. The only limit to God's grace is our own lack of faith. The only limit to God's ability is our own lack of faith. God is abundant with this gift. He's abundant in such a way that he's given us enough grace to cover all our sin. He's given us enough grace to cover all our sin. I don't know about you, but I needed an abundant amount. I still do. And God's gracious to provide that. Romans chapter 5 verse 20 says this, Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, what? Grace, what? All the more. You've got to have the all in there. Grace abounded all the more. So, think you're a pretty bad sinner? Actually, most people don't think they're that bad a sinner. That's part of the problem. <laughs> Just don't think I really need God that much. But when you take purity and you, convince, and you, and you put it up next to uh, someone who's not pure, it's rather obvious. He says this, don't worry about it, Dave. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Paul comes back and says, well, that mean, does that mean I should sin more so I can get more grace? That's not what he's saying. So that as sin reigned in death, that's what happens through sin. Grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And there's that word eternal again. Infinite, eternal. It's hard for me to imagine. To be living outside the scope of time. We are, we are so, and of course we are, we're governed by time. The sun came up this morning, and when the sun came up this morning, I was thinking, um, all right, here we go, it's another day. And guess what? I had, <laughs> this morning I was thinking, and the sun's coming up tomorrow, too. <laughs> and the next day. We're, you know, that's just life for us. We, we can't begin to imagine what it would be like to live outside of time. I know we have vacations. We try to pretend. But even in our vaca vacations, we think, oh, man, there's a lot of stuff I want to do on my vacation. <laughs> and then we plan our days, especially if we have kids. We plan our days with all the things we're going to do with our kids so they have something that they're going to do and be active in. What would it be like? Living outside of time. Difficult for us to, to, to get a mind, our mind around it. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. His grace is enough to cover all our sin. It's abundant. It's abundant to accomplish every good work. This is a great encouragement. I've heard people say, man, I really want to do something great for God. I, I love it when people say that. But the way it's going to be done is only through the gift that comes through grace, through God. 
2 Corinthians chapter 12, 9 says this. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. It's enough. For my power is made perfect in weakness. How, how completely countercultural is this to our day and age? His power is made perfect in my... Say it. Say it. Live it. We're so, man, we, we, we want to be, uh, um, they have these cartoons where you see these uh, weightlifters. God's weightlifter. In my mind, I'm going, whoa. But God doesn't look at it that way at all. He sees this bony 98-pound weakling. He gets sand kicked in his face, and he says, wait, let me show you what I can do. God's waiting for us to say, wait, God, God, show me. I'm weak. I'm worn out. I'm not going to make it. I'm struggling. I'm, I, 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 I can hardly breathe. And God's saying, son, I got it. I got it. That's a huge comfort. I don't have to hold on. I don't have to be in fear that I'll lose my strength and fall away. I don't have to hold on. He's got me. The weaker I become, the stronger he then becomes. The stronger that he works. So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You know what that power of Christ is? That's the power of the resurrection. <laughs> Bam! You thought, an exp you thought a, the Big Bang was something. You should have been there for the resurrection. And, and his presence has been expanding ever since. I mean, come on. He's, it's, it's amazing. This verse speaks about being possessed by an unfailing strength. We grow weak. We grow tired. We, we grow weary. But he has this unfailing strength of grace to be strong in us, to suffice, to be enough. And I, I want you to understand this. When we say that God is able, when we say that his grace is sufficient, what we're saying is there can be no mixture. There can be no mixture of my strength and God's grace. We like to do deals with God. All right, God, I got this. Let me take care of this and what I can't do, then I'll let you do. That's not what that verse is saying. It's in our weakness that we're strong. There can be no mixture of our ability with what God wants to do. We just need to be available to Him. Our response is not to be the Christian strong man. Now, don't get me wrong here. I think there's a whole lot of benefit in having a strong body, okay? I think there's a whole lot of benefit in being healthy and strong. It helps your, your attitude. It actually helps you to be able to understand this a little bit better too. But when it comes to living life and spiritual matters, I don't, I don't, it's not my responsibility to develop strength, but to let God work through. Let his strength fill me. Let it be about him. I can't be filled with God's spirit and then filled with my own strengths and abilities. He gives them to me. He gives me his gift. So when we talk about this attitude of God's abundance, of, of, of giving everything, all of this infinite grace, which completely overwhelms us, it means we are without excuse. We, don't, we just simply don't have an excuse. So what is the attraction of God's grace? I also find this uh, rather overwhelming. What is God's grace attracted to? You. You. Now, The infinite and vast grace of God is attracted by us. He says this, For God so loved the world that he gave 
his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Isn't that amazing? Who did he do that for? Us. And since we're God's creation, he's created us in his own image. He's created us in his own image. All of us. All of us. Ephesians 2 says in verse 8, For by grace you have been saved. By grace, his gift. You have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's a gift. It's the gift of God. It's not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God's Infinite grace is abundantly directed towards you and I. So the question might be, well, have you accepted? Have you accepted the gift? Have you received this gift of grace? There's no reason for not accepting it except for, I think I can do better than God. We have no reason to distrust the goodness of God, the graciousness of God. We have no reason to question or doubt his power, his ability to provide this grace. John chapter 11, verse 25 says this. He was speaking to a woman who he had met at a well. The conversation had gone back and forth, and she was pretty amazed with this guy, Jesus, that was talking. First of all, he was talking to a woman, and, and secondly, that he was talking to a Samaritan woman. And so Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He asked her the question. So Jesus is asking the question, do you believe this? Quickly, I want to say, Oh, yes, oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. But you know, in honesty, I just, I wonder what in the world. Why would God love me? Why would God love me? Let's go back again to the place I have in the universe. Standing right here. You've seen that Google thing where they, they take this picture from... Uh, a girl lying in the sand, and it goes all the way out to space. And, and I think about that, I'm going, why in the world would God love me? What is there that I could possibly give to God that would say, wow, Dave, I really love you for that. But he just created me in his own image. He created me for the purpose of having a fellowship and a relationship with him. God wants so much that from uh, uh, that relationship from us. And he says, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He's asking. 1 John chapter 4, 15 says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him. Whoa. Are you, you know, I read things like this and I'm going, well, the Bible says so, but God abides in him. That's amazing. And he in God. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, there's a possibility you might be saved. Is that what it says? <laughs> no, 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 no. He says, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified and with the mouth, one confesses, and in our confession, we live according to our confession. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I don't know where you are. I don't know 
what your situation is. I don't know where you are as far as your relationship with God. And I don't know what sins are, 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 are surrounding you, are preventing you. I don't know what pride that's filling your heart and your mind. But I can say this absolutely, that God's grace is sufficient to cover all your sin. He will take care and wash away all of your sin. He will say, I will take your sin. And in exchange, he says, I will give you my righteousness. That's the righteousness of God. Absolutely, utterly amazing. And here's the thing. I, I don't know, and it, it, and it can be my own ignorance, but I don't know of another religion anywhere that makes that kind of promise. Every other religion that I know about is, you do your best to be pleasing to God. And too often we have that religious thought in our minds. But God says, wait. I'll take your sin and I'll give you my righteousness. And that righteousness then, that transformation takes place so that we want to live that righteous life. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The question I have is this. Does everyone include you? Does it include you? Let's pray. Our heads are bowed in prayer. And so, I ask again the question, does everyone include you? Are you under his grace or are you under his judgment? Are your sins completely covered and washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ? Will you call on him today? So, Father, we, we come to you and, and uh, we, <laughs> it would take us thousands and thousands of lifetimes to be able to cover or to begin to probe the depths of your grace. And just for these past few minutes, we've tried to look at it. And I pray, Father, that through your word, you've spoken to our hearts about the vastness of your love, your mercy, and your grace that you give to us, and you give yourself to us. May we simply, humbly, reach out and say, Jesus, I need you. I'm a sinner, desperately in need of the saving life of Jesus Christ. I pray that would be all of us who would hold on to your grace and make it ours. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, please.